Welcome back to our medical missionary training course where we're looking at starting a retreat. And I was asked to give the isotonic drink. And this is a drink that will guarantee a bowel movement within about an hour. We don't usually use it because not everyone can handle it. So they've got to try and drink this two litres in about half an hour. And it's one third sea water, one third boiling water and one third spring water. So it comes out as warm and it's slightly salty. Yeah? You mentioned before the other recipe as one cup of water, one teaspoon. Okay, so to, to make sea water, it's one teaspoon of salt to one cup of water. That's uh, that's seawater. That's to make seawater. So what we do in Australia, I know at Living Valley Springs, the retreat, they give all their guests this isotonic drink, and they go to the beach and collect the seawater, and just use seawater. So when you're collecting seawater, you have to go where, ideally away from a town and the purest water will be found. So you've probably seen Australian beaches. Australia has the most beautiful beaches. It's fine white sand. So, and yet the coastline sort of will go like that, bit rocky, then another beach. So the best place to, to collect the sea seawater is right in the middle. You come out a little bit where the, the waves are crashing because the waves are constantly purifying the water. So it's, it, and of course that's a very cheap drink <laughs> to get the to get the bowels moving, but it's very important that you have something. When I was in a retreat in Manchester recently, they have a, they have an, a dried aloe um, powder that they buy, and that that gets the bowels moving. And so for aloe to do that, it must have some of that yellow that, line, that lines the leaf. But because when I was at Living Valley Springs, I did see that, that some people experienced quite a bit of discomfort. Some people just couldn't drink that much. And I also say, saw staff pressuring people to drink it. <laughs> and you know they, they've come to a retreat for a holiday, and then I want to sit down and drink that. But if someone's sick, like the man I told you about with Michael, he was ready to drink anything <laughs> to just get, to get this moving. So you also feel your way with your people. If we get someone come that want that drink, of course we'll, we'll make it up for them. But we find that the, the coal and tea, as we looked at yesterday, the buckthorn licorice and cascara, we find that that drunk of an evening in the morning, they will go a couple of times. So that works well. I think it's also very important when you have your health retreat to have a couple of enema kits. So that if you get someone who, who is in a lot of discomfort, you can give them an enema and they'll have relief you know, within about half an hour. And I know in Australia you can, they have books where, you know, things you can order, different equipments, and they usually will have a book that'll show you can order an enema kit. So then the question is, what herbs? What herbs do you, should you have on hand? I went through some herbs uh, when we looked at the gut, and I told you of the digestive tea mix that we have. And I also showed you the colon tea mix. And of course you adjust this depending on where you live and what herbs you are able to get. We have lemongrass growing, we have a lot of peppermint growing. I notice you've got some very nice peppermint out there. And um, so if a guest wants a, a tea, 
we'll usually give them a fresh tea, which is fresh peppermint or fresh lemongrass or grated ginger. That's also a very nice tea. So the juices that we serve are predominantly 80% carrot and 10% apple and 10% celery. Celery definitely is a crop that is very sprayed. So I think it's very important that the Health Retreat uh, grow their own celery. Before I left Misty Mountain, uh, we, we've had three beds of celery, but I made up another whole bed of celery because we were just going into winter. In summer, the celery goes to seed. And once the celery goes to seed, the base of the celery, little tiny celery plants start popping up. They're connected to like the mother plant. And you dig that up and just break them up and that enabled me to start another whole bed of celery. Our celery um, looks like the celery. Have you seen uh, Katia's celery out there? They're only little plants, aren't they? Yeah, that's what our celery looks like. <laughs> it looks more like Italian parsley, but it's very dark green and it's very high in, in uh, chlorophyll, being so dark green, very high in minerals. The celery that you buy in the shop has really been pumped full of chemicals to make it look, look the, way, the way it does. And in the shop, most people buy celery for the stalks. Well, we use probably mostly the leaves. You don't Only the leaves? Ah, uh, we do do the stalk, but they're thin. They're not big and fat like the, like the ones in the shops. We had a French chef working for us down at uh, Mountain View. Our retreat was called Mountain View when we were in Melbourne and he always used the leaves. In fact, he, he valued the leaves more than he valued the stalk. And it's the flavour really. It's the flavour that you're getting. So that's, that's our 8 a.m. juice. So our 10 a.m. juice is Granny Smith apple, they're the green apples, and ginger. This is a delicious juice, but if we have diabetics there, we have people conquering cancer, instead of giving them that because you don't want them to have so much apple, it's a bit too sweet, we just give them this again. So the 12 o'clock juice, or I think on the chart it's 11.30 or 11.45 juice. It's, um, I think it's about 40% cucumber. And cucumber is very alkalizing and a wonderful cleanser. And 40% apple. And 20% greens. So the greens can be, um, Steen Adela, they can be a little bit of celery, they can be uh, pumpkin tops, any edible green. And we also try and put a good handful of mint into that. So as you can imagine, that's, that comes out a very dark green mix and it's, um, and the guests very much like it. So we two... A day before, you do that on Sunday? We, no, we do these two Sunday. And that allows our, our chef or our cook to come in a little later. And our, our cook comes in, say, at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they do the other juices. And then in the late afternoon, then they'll juice for the next two days. For the, for the next day, the first two juices. So the 2 p.m. juice. So the 2 p.m. juice is, I think it's about 70% carrot. and 10% apple and 10% beetroot. Ten percent celery. If you give um, too much beetroot, because we when we're at Living Valley Springs, one of the students 
read about the wonders of beetroot and he gave the guests straight beetroot juice and some of them vomited straight back up, some of them got quite sick. See what the beetroot does, it can stimulate the liver to clean and it's, it's too, too fast. So make the juice and you might think I'd like more beetroot in that. So you might eliminate the apple and do 20% beetroot. You can certainly play around with it. So the last juice of the day is the 4 p.m. juice. And the 4 p.m. juice is 50% carrot and 50% pineapple. And if pineapple's something that you can't get or you can't get decent ones and perhaps in Sweden you can't, um, you could you could do an, another one of any of those. So for our, our people who are here conquering cancer or conquering diabetes, we'll do the carrot, celery and apple juice again at 10 and the carrot, <coughs> celery and apple juice again um, at 4 p.m. so they don't have that sweet. And then, it's, and then they're having their steam bath, as you can see, from 3.30 Ladies 3.30 to 4.30 and the men are 4.30 to 5.30 and then 6.30 broth is served and that's a lot of vegetables. So I'll give you the recipe for broth. Um, we do carrots and you keep the skin on, uh, onions. So for carrots it might be four onions it might be two if they're big, maybe four if they're little, and potato with the skin on. The only time we don't leave the skin on the onions if it, if it looks a bit black or, or not nice. We only use it if it looks nice, if it looks clean. Potatoes two if they're big, a few more if they're not so big. Celery, so with the celery you'd use about one cup and stinging nettle. So with the stinging nettle, you do about two, two cups of that. And that has a simmer for four to five hours. And so after four to five hours, you strain that out and then you add Celtic salt to taste and that's the broth that the guests have. So I guess looking at, oh, I suppose you do about four litres of water to that. And of course, um, depending on how many guests you've got, if you double it or halve it. This is one portion for one person. Oh no, that's for all, that's for uh, all your guests. They would have because it's four liters. Again, depending on. So your average each guest will have about two cups. So this is it will be a liquid. Sorry. If, uh, pure liquid, liquid, pure liquid. Okay. Yeah. So it's a broth, meaning like a very thin soup. Okay. Now on cooking days, what our cooks usually do is they throw the. Uh, they can throw the carrot tops in, they could throw the, the, um, the cauliflower leaves in, the stalk of the broccoli gets thrown in. So when the guests aren't eating, so Monday, Tuesday, that's the basic recipe. But when the, when the cooks are in the kitchen, they always have a broth pot there and they throw the bits and pieces and they chop up an onion if the skin looks good, well, that gets thrown in the broth pot. The more onion skins that go in, it goes a nice dark brown colour because you probably know they, they use un, onion, stings to, onion skins to uh, dye, dye things. Sometimes they use it to dye wool, a nice golden colour, golden brown colour. You mean the crunchy part of the onion skin? Mm -hmm. Skin. The complete outside of the skin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the broth is made fresh every, uh, every evening? Ah, uh, sometimes. Sometimes we have guests that want four cups each turn per night and then we certainly 
would make a bit more and then we have other guests that just have one cup or half a cup and we might have a lot left over so you certainly can do the next day and on Friday they usually cook double so because our, our cooks on on Sabbath our cooks come in for breakfast they serve the breakfast they get the dishes done and then our cooks are free until Sunday morning breakfast so what happens at lunchtime? Usually they make a lasagna and they assemble the lasagna and put it in the fridge. We always give our guests a dessert on Sabbath and that might be a frozen cheesecake, so that's easy. That can be made Monday or Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to always give the, give the lecture on the mind in the morning and when I'd finished I'd go down and put the lasagna in the oven, make the salad, steam some broccoli and Michael and I would serve the lunch. That allows the rest of the staff to have most of their day off. So our exercise coordinator, Howard, he does the morning exercise with the guests and then he and his family go to church and they, they're back by say three o'clock and then they light the steam bath and the guests have their steam bath. So how it gets most of the day off. So that's what we try and do on Sabbath. Everyone has a portion off. And I come in at eight and uh, do the lecture and then I go home after lunch is finished and then I have the rest of the day off. So it's, it's nice to work out um, shift with, with your staff so that you're not overworking them and it enables them to be able to implement exercise. We had, one, we had one cook and she would come in early, she would serve the breakfast and then she'd go and have her walk. And then she'd come back and then she'd have breakfast because we usually have someone helping the cook in the dishes. Mm -hmm. How many are you, uh, the staff? Uh, I think we've got about six. Six persons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can handle like uh, ten or six. Yeah. How many guests you can handle? Well, we try not to have any more than uh, twelve. Mm -hmm. We try not to have any more than twelve. But um, it's hard for Michael to say no because pays the bills. <laughs> Can you name them, please, the, the stuff, what you have? Okay, you have I'll, sh I'll show you what we have. We have a few volunteers too. There's always people wanting to work at Misty Mountain. And one of, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people want to come and work because our health retreat works and it, it pays itself. And I've met a lot of health retreats that it doesn't. And that's why you have to have a business head behind it. Now, we see our health retreat as our mission, but it is a business. And if it doesn't run as a business, it won't last long. <laughs> so, you know, some people don't like it to be classified as that. So we classify it personally as a mission. But if we advertised as a mission, we'd get no atheists. <laughs> so we advertise as a health retreat. It's a family business. But our aim is to teach people health. And we find again and again, it opens the door to spiritual things. That's what we want. You probably don't have so many Adventists, though. Pardon? You don't have very many Adventists? Ah, uh, no. Sometimes we'll have no Adventists. Sometimes we'll have two or three. Sometimes we'll have a whole family come and be a bit more. But we don't. And I've been to some health retreats in America and they're all, health they're all Adventists. Mm -hmm. And God meant the health work to be set out to reach out to the non-Adventists. Of course the Adventists can come. And a lot of Adventists need to come because a lot of Adventists don't know the health message. And I just love it in the steam bath when you get someone say to you, 
Why are you a seven-day Adventist? Oh, don't you love that question? Are you with them in the steam bath? We always have a staff member in the steam bath. Always. You're sometimes in there as well. Yeah, I usually do, I usually do every Wednesday with the, with the guests. And Michael and I eat lunch with them every day. Every day? Yeah, every day. We have um, breakfast at home with us. And also um, with breakfast, the, the staff will take turns in, uh, in, having breakfast, in having breakfast with the guests. So we've got Michael. Michael's the, basically the business manager. And then we've got Graham. I think that's how you spell his name. And it was incredible how we got Graham. And this shows you God's hand over the work. So when I was banned, I was forbidden to give any health advice. So what I started to do, I'd get some, a staff member to sit there and go through the questionnaire and then I'd ask questions and then I'd comment, but I'm not the front person there. And I was still lecturing, but I'd say, this is not a health lecture. I'm just going to talk about the body that I live in. But when the Health Care Complaints Commission contacted me early 2021 and said, we notice you're doing Zooms, because I was doing a lot of Zooms all over the world, they said, this is a violation of your prohibition order, final warning or three years jail. Michael said, I, I don't want you to lecture anymore. <laughs> and so we had a meeting with the staff and it was just so lovely because someone said, I'll, I'll do the water. <laughs> and then another one said, I'll do the exercise. And so our lec the lectures now are spread between all our, all our staff which is really nice. And then we had one girl come who'd done our program and she wanted to come and work as a volunteer. And she was a uh, scientist. She had a degree in chemistry. She was about 45. And she used to work for the pharmaceutical company making up drugs. And after being to our program, she was convicted. She should not do this anymore. She was not an Adventist, but she was a Christian and a Sabbath keeper. And so in the lockdown, we're uh, weeding together. You can tell a lot about a person by the way they weed, you know. <laughs> so we're weeding in the garden. And I really noticed that she always went deep and got the weeds. You know, some people come into the garden, can I help you get the hoe? And oh, dear, oh, dear, dear, dear. All they want to do is skim the top and then they've done that and they've gone. I want the ones that dig deep. <laughs> And while we're talking, I said, um, how would you feel about doing the consultation? She said, it's all my dreams come true. Mm -hmm. Praise be to God. And so I sat with her in the consultations. And she's a very caring girl. It worked very, very well. And she gave some of the lectures. I really liked it because, because she had a scientific mind, she'd, she'd go right into the wise. And then I went overseas for eight months last year. And I'd been gone three months and Marcus said, you wouldn't believe it, Nikki's put in a resignation. I said, oh dear, there's our health director. <laughs> and I said to her, you, you know, we, we'll just call you the, the health coach. Because she said, I haven't got any qualifications. And we said, you're just the health coach. That, that's all you need to do. Take, take the advice, take the... So I take the information on the person and they go through the program. Really and truly, no matter what the problem is, if they go through that program, they will, they will benefit. Whatever the health problem, if they implement these laws, they're going to get a benefit. What, what, whatever the problem, from a sore toe to mental illness and everything in between. Michael said, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, why did she leave? And he said, ah, oh, she got a boyfriend. <laughs> And the boyfriend didn't want to live out there. And we were having a bit of a break and Michael went up to see his brother who lives northern New South Wales. And when he was there, he met a man named Graham. Now, Graham was the top naturopath at Living Valley Springs for 11 years. And he's retired now. And Michael said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm retired. But of course, 
someone who's 69 and healthy, they're, you know, they've still got a lot of, a lot to give and look good. So Michael said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm painting. And he said, and by the way, I'm homeless. I can't get across the border back into Queensland to get home. So this is, this is mid 2021 where Australia has gone mad and locking down states. Michael said, come to Misty Mountain. We've got plenty of room and plenty of painting. So when Michael told me that Graham was at Misty Mountain, I said, Michael, Graham was the head naturopath at Living Valley Springs for 11 years. Use Graham. So Michael approached Graham and said, how do you feel about uh, staying here a bit longer and being our health director? And Graham said, I could do that. So all he does is the consultations and I think two lectures. That's all he does because he's retired. He said to Michael, I'm retired, so you don't have to give me a wage. Praise God. Because <laughs> that's a, a big, uh, you know, that's a big payment from, that we have to do is the wages. I think Michael gives him a little bit. So he's got his own house and he loves it at Misty Mountain. Have you Googled Misty Mountain and had a look at it? We've got helicopter views of Misty Mountain. It's, yes. it's very beautiful. We have guests drive in and say, I feel better already because it's just so beautiful. That's what you have to make sure. When they're driving in, everything they're looking at is really nice. So if you have a load of rubbish, make sure it's out the back. <laughs> if you have a wood pile, make sure it's neat so that everything they see looks very nice. So Graham, and praise be to God, um, we, we don't have to give him much money. He's happy, we're happy, and the guests are happy because because he does the live blood analysis and the guests all love that. So then we've got Robin. Robin was an atheist and the first time she did our program, she complained about the religious aspect of it, which isn't very much. Well, after doing our program 15 times over 16 years, and she had her own beautician business in Melbourne, she retired. But she was only 48 and she got bored. So she said to Michael, can I come and work volunteer at Misty Mountain? And of course, over 15 programs, she's softening on the religious side. So she's now our office manager. And she comes to all our Wednesday night prayer meeting with her Bible in hand. And she asked me when we're in the garden weeding, would you give me Bible studies? Praise be to God. So we usually only will employ seven-day Adventists, but this woman is dynamo <laughs> and she's very, very open. She even came to Michael and said, Michael, I want to start paying tithe <laughs> and I want to back pay. I haven't paid tithe. So little by little, she's, she's coming into the truth, which is very, very nice. And then we have Marlene. Can you see that God's given us these people? And Marlene, I might have told the story, I was in Denver in 20, 2019 and I was running a retreat there and I think there were about 20 guests there so it was a very busy program and the, and the director of the retreat came to me and said, Barbara, there's this girl, she wants to see you. I've told her you are too busy, but she's come from Germany. I said, I'll talk to her. I'll talk to her half an hour. And it was Marlene. And she had very short hair and she had jeans on. And she said, oh, I'm, I want to help people. She wasn't a Christian. I want to, um, I want to help mothers particularly. Could I come to Misty Mountain? And I said, yep, if you get there, we can give you a bed and you can work volunteer for a few months. So it was only about three months later and Marlene arrived. Marlena arrived at Misty Mountain Health Retreat. And she'd just become a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And then COVID hit and she couldn't go anywhere. Well, it's two and a half years later now. And Marlena is our cook. <laughs> And she has beautiful long hair. <laughs> she's, uh, she's a lovely girl. And she's 26. And so in, in 2020, 
when uh, I couldn't travel, we had lockdown and then we could start running again, I worked with Marlena in the kitchen and taught her how, how we cook the things we do. And she's, she's amazing now, she's our cook. And then we've got uh, Howard. So Howard, who's been with us for 20 years, the guest thinks he's 35 and he's 55. He's Dutch Indonesian, he's incredibly fit. He's very, very fit, he's a cyclist. And he's a funny guy. He gets the guests laughing, the most grumpiest guests laughing. And so for 20 years, he's been waking up at five o'clock every morning and waking up our guests at six and taking them on the exercise program at 6.30 to 7.30. And he's also our massage therapist. And at one o'clock every day, he does a core strengthening or Pilates type exercises. And then in the afternoon after lunch, he chops wood and lights the steam bath and, and runs the steam bath for the guests. And after 20 years, he still maintains he's got the best job in the world. That's nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And we know how long he's been with us because his son is 19 now. And when they came to us, they didn't think they could have children. So he and his wife, uh, they're both massage therapists from New Zealand. She is uh, English Samoan and he is Dutch Indonesian. And she's a very beautiful woman. She has that light Samoan look and very dark hair. Well, six months after they started working for us, they came into Michael's office one day and said, look, sorry, Michael, we've got some bad news. He said, what's that? He said, Evelyn's pregnant. <laughs> it was a joke. <laughs> of course, they were very happy about it, but Michael said, oh, no. <laughs> That's my husband's sense of humor. He's going to lose a worker. <laughs> so Evelyn had her baby, and then two years later, she had another baby, and she homeschooled her, her babies. And then as the boys got a little bit older, they became our mower boys because we have a lot of land. If you see from our aerial shots, we've got a lot of land. So Michael has two uh, ride-on mowers. And in the summertime, those boys are just about mowing the whole time. He let them mow for six months on trial. And if they were okay, then he'd pay them a wage. <laughs> And their father's Dutch Indonesian, so he's very fussy, so they certainly look after the equipment. So that's been a great blessing. And so Howard's wife, Evelyn, the boys, the youngest boy's 15 now, and he's finished school. So Evelyn approached Michael and she said, could I be the sanitarium supervisor? And I said to Michael, please, everything how Evelyn does is just so. So ever since she's been the supervisor, every cupboard you open, perfect order, perfect order, perfect order. She has everything just right. So it's really nice to have someone in the health centre who has their eye on everything. We also have a colonic irrigation set up and I used to do all the colonics. And then I trained my girl, uh, Emilia, that worked with me for five years. Then she took over and did all the colonics. And I've now trained Evelyn, so she does the colonic irrigations. So she has her eye on the health centre, and if need be, she might do a facial and she might do a, a colonic. And so she's working for us full time now. And their son, Carsten, he's 15. He's the kitchen hand. So he works with uh, Marlena in the kitchen. And then we've got... Oh, there's more than six, isn't there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, we're getting a bit more. I was just guessing. And then we've got Dave. Yeah, Uncle Dave. Uncle Dave. He's our maintenance man. He's an Aboriginal man. So <coughs> when you've got uh, winter coming, you know, every house has a wood heater. So he keeps the wood up. He empties the compost bins. He empties the, he empties the rubbish. And he also slashes the paddocks and... So he like, does, does a bit of everything. So with Carsten, he's really part-time, so he's casual. So Michael just gives him a fairly small wage when he does work. So you've got uh, 
all the rest. She's casual too. She only gets paid if she works, whereas Howard, Marlene, Robin, and Robin's um, Robin's a full-time worker. Marlene's a full Howard's a full-time worker. Now Dave, he is on a a uh, disability pension from the government because he's got a bad back or something happened. So he does not need very much either. The government are very, very liberal on payments to Aboriginal people. So really, we only have to give uh, a full-time wage to, to these three. Michael takes a wage. And Evelyn, you could say she's casual. And Carsten's casual. And Dave and uh, Graham, we don't give them a full wage because they're getting benefits. And then we also, and then, oh, we've got Shirley. Now, Shirley's also an Aboriginal lady. And Shirley and Dave just got married. <laughs> and Shirley and Dave are both in their late 50s. <clears throat> She's being an Aboriginal woman, she also gets payments from the government, so we also don't give her a full wage, but Michael does give them something. And then we have volunteers that come. We've got a lady who did the program, then she came back to volunteer, and she brought her daughter with her who's homeschooled, and she's a dyslexic girl, so she, she gives her a lot of... Um, attention and she also gets a payment from the government as like her carer and uh, they both work at Misty Mountain now in fact she just went home and sold her house packed it up and came back to Misty Mountain she said I just love it here can I just stay here? <laughs> and there's always help needed there's always lots to be done and since Shirley's been the laundry lady perfection in the laundry Everything's folded perfectly and just right. And I think, I think that is very important, that everything the guests look at be just right. Again, it doesn't have to be expensive state-of-the-art, but you can keep it very neat and very clean. And that, that keeps them comfortable. So we, every afternoon, all the floors are swept and all the floors are mopped every afternoon. And the guest rooms are serviced every day. Pardon, who's cleaning? So uh, Evelyn, she's in charge of the cleaning. Uh, Shirley does the laundry. Often the volunteers are helping with that. If need be, Robin comes and helps as well. And so when we service the guest room, so you'll notice there's a two-hour lecture every morning. So while the lecture's on, the... Uh, the rooms are serviced and we say to our guests if you want a clean towel put your towel on the floor if you want to keep your towel hang, hang it up and I think most hotels do that and the food you are gardening and you are making the food to the health retreat or you are buying the food uh, we buy some food and we um, we find that uh, gardening's not easy it's not easy at all um, I spend three hours a day in the garden. My back doesn't want me to do garden any more than that. But I'm able to keep things fairly under control. But we had so much rain this year, not one tomato ripened. And all the cucumber plants died when the rain started big time. And in the summer, all the lettuce go to seed. You've, there's so much, there's so much that you're, you're battling. And it is nice to have garden produce, but um, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Are you prepared for uh, times when there is no electricity, there is uh, no water from uh, the commune yeah. and, and all of that? Well, our, this, is, this is the road coming in, so I'll give you a layout of our property. Michael and my house are here. There's a grid there. Do you know what a cattle grid is? Yeah. And um, the creek, so I'll do the creek blue. So the creek, the creek comes in like this and weaves around. There's a bridge there. So it goes like this and then there's the bridge there. So can you see how it weaves all around our property? And the health centre 
The health centre is here and the bridge is here. We've got a bridge that was already there and um, the health centre is there, the kitchen is here and we've got rooms up the top there and the <coughs> staff dormitories over there, we've got another house there and another house there and Howard lives in a house up there. So all the, pro all the land here is ours to there and then all the land from about there is ours. And this is all bush, all bush, all up there. And then you've got the steam sauna, the steam sauna is down there at the creek, oh it's probably about Steam saunas about there. The you creek. Them? No, they were all they were all there when we came, but we had to renovate all of them. Even though we got the land at a fairly good price, the houses were in a terrible state of disrepair. So they've, and we did it little <coughs> by little by little before the ban was put on me. So let's say for eight years. We averaged 12 to 14 guests every program. So that's... Had more staff at that time? Uh, yes, we had another massage therapist. So this, this girl here, she does massage. Marlene can do massage. Evelyn can do massage. So they all do, all do a bit. Um, and I was, of course, was working full time whereas Graham works part-time. So you, so we're doing two programs, one off. Two programs, one off. Two programs, one off. All year, except for November. And in November, the staff have their holidays and we find November's quiet, so we usually close down for, I think, three or four weeks. And that's when I used to travel overseas and do lectures. If ever I went away, I could just only go away for two weeks because I'd have to be back to, to do the program. So when you're charging two and a half thousand dollars per person, so we, we were running very well. So the, we're a non-profit or were before the government took us office. With a non-profit organisation, all the money goes back into, back into the business. So little by little with that income, we're able to little by little by little um, do all the houses, do all the buildings up. And the treatments you're putting in here, it's not so much that you do the treatments, it's more or less the massages you have most of the time. And we, we have a few, are. yeah, we have a few treatments. So the, the treatments are, so we have massage, that's the straight Swedish massage full body or we have a lymphatic massage which is a very gentle massage on the lymphatic system. We also offer facials. And they are part of the program, the facial, they have to pay that extra? There's, there's two, two treatments per program, they so they choose. And we also have the colonic and we have a, a hyperbaric chamber. Does it have to be um, somebody has to sit next to, next to the hyperbaric chamber? No, um, we check them every 15 minutes. And Shirley, the laundry lady, it's down next to the laundry, so she's working in the laundry, so she just goes and checks it every 15 minutes. So they're, they're, they're the treatments that they would choose. And some people choose extra, and if they choose extra, that's extra money for them, yeah? The colonics, is it um, manual or do you have a machine? We have a machine. But you've got an, uh, a therapist there the whole time. Okay. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier sometime about that you had protein powder for when they were doing juicing. Yes, yeah, so you'll, you'll, see on the, you'll see on the program there. So it's... Um, I'll put it here so the eight, this is Monday, so on Monday the 8 o'clock juice, you got a 10 o'clock juice, you got a 12 and you got a 2 and you got a 4. So green barley is served with the 8 juice, 12 juice and 4 juice on Monday 
and then protein powder at these two. And because on Tuesday they go into the second stage of the liver detox, remember when we looked at the liver? So your eight o'clock juice is protein, your 10 o'clock is green barley, 12 o'clock protein, two o'clock green barley, and four o'clock is protein. So the protein, let me give you the recipe for protein. So we do, we, they each have about, half, it comes up to about half a cup. Half a cup of milk. So that milk is usually soy or almond. We find they're a little bit richer than the rice milk. Rice milk's a little bit thin. And then one teaspoon of protein powder. We use a pea protein powder, but you might be able to get hemp or brown rice or organic soy, and one teaspoon of um, coconut cream. And that makes it really creamy and nice. And then you might do one drop of stevia. And we do that because of the second stage of the liver detox, which we talked about in the liver lecture. And the green barley? What's that? Green barley. So that's the protein drink. And the green barley is um, one teaspoon of green barley powder. And we usually do half a teaspoon of vitamin C and one teaspoon of vitamin B. We have a liquid vitamin B that's B1, B2, B3, B6, B9, B12. And we mix that with lemon, lemon and water, lemon juice and water. So as you can imagine, when you've got 10 guests, you're making it all up at once in a blender. And when you've got 10 guests, we mix this all up in a jar. So that'd be 10 teaspoons of green barley, five teaspoons of that, 10 teaspoons of that. You might do it the juice of a lemon and some water, shake it up and then tip it into the glasses, yeah? You mentioned earlier about vitamin C that it wasn't the or was a special type of vitamin C? Yeah, it's not just ascorbic acid, so it's ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. And because this is so well acknowledged today, you'll find many vitamin C powders state, we have bioflavonoids. But there are some cheaper brands that'll just be ascorbic acid. How important was it to have the green barley? Like, if they have the juice, what's the what's the thought behind it? Rather than that, it's healthy. Yeah, the green the green barley is one of the best blood and tissue cleansers, and it's that chlorophyll. So because they're going through a detox, and because everything they're losing in the detox is acid, the green barley helps to alkalize, and it's one of the best blood and tissue cleansers. So it's just aiding in the detox. Yes? I have seen also they are selling barley grown kits. Uh -huh. to yes, yes. We, um, we had one of our workers was growing uh, wheatgrass. But we found that it molded so easy if they had a lot of rain. So, um, yeah, you've got to be very careful of quality control. <laughs> When you're, when you're growing them. Yes? I, I just wonder what a hyperbaric uh, is. Oh, what's a hyperbaric chamber? Oh, I've rubbed it out. This, this first was discovered, I think it's probably about 50 years ago. Divers coming up too quick, deep sea divers, they would get the bends. And what happens is, the nitrogen goes into little bubbles in the joints and 
causes great pain. So what, you ha what they did was they developed the hyperbaric chambers and the hyperbaric chamber is oxygen being pumped into the body under pressure. Because Henry Law states that under pressure, more gas goes into liquid. And the excess oxygen going in just causes the nitrogen to disperse. But then they discovered that the increase in oxygen, which the hyperbaric chamber causes, it, it uh, induces rapid healing in wounds that are a little bit stubborn to heal. So it's putting more oxygen into the, into the body. I know in Brisbane, in the hospital there, they have a hyperbaric chamber room and people from all over the state go there, especially diabetics with ulcers that aren't healing, so slow wound healing. They also found that to be very effective to help conquer cancer. And remember, the cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. So that's why it works there. Yeah? Which kind of authorization you need from the state or to start the retreat? Do you, do you need anything what for? type of auth authorization? Not really, not really, because um, you're just teaching people how to give their body the right conditions for healing. So you're almost like a glorified hotel. So we needed to, the health department had to do an assessment on our kitchen because we're serving food. And I think our cooks had to do a food handlers course, something like that. And they insist that everything be rinsed in bleach, but we don't. So we have all the bottles of bleach there, but they're never used. You can also fill a bottle of bleach with vinegar and uh, rinse it in vinegar. So they're just happy that the bottles are there. <laughs> And we don't say anything. <coughs> so they come and control again? Well, we're a long way from town. <laughs> so they don't come out very much. And after a very uncomfortable experience that one of the council men had with Michael that no one wants to come out now. Michael ordered him off our property and then rang the mayor and told the mayor that we'd been harassed by a council member. See, they'd given us an order to close because they said we were the wrong zoning because this was an Aboriginal boarding school. And when we first went there, we had to get a development application. So Michael met with all the heads and we went through every building and Michael said, uh, yes, we're using that for housing. Yes, for housing. Yes, we're teaching in there. Yes, that's accommodation. So every building, we were using it for what it had been zoned for. And our original name is Misty Mountain Health and Lifestyle Education Centre. And so when they looked at it, Michael said, well, gentlemen, I think that we, uh, we comply. And they said, yeah. And we didn't hear anything for three years. And then a new mayor came on. And the new mayor contacted Michael and said, close down immediately, you're running illegally. Well, Michael refused to open the letter and just kept sending the letter back. <laughs> he wouldn't even touch the letter. And so then the mayor rang him and said, Michael, would you please read the letter? So Michael had a meeting and said, we've already had the meeting. And they said, we have no record of that meeting and uh, we don't believe you comply. Michael said, but we're a teaching institution. And they said, but you're not a registered school. So close down immediately or $10,000 fine. Mm. So Michael had to investigate and find out how, how we had to be zoned as something. So we found out the only thing we could be zoned, at, zoned as was a, um, uh, environmental tourism facility. Now Michael argued with them we are not tourism but that's the only thing they would agree with. But then we had to do all of these things to comply with becoming a uh, environmental tourism. We had to have a sprinkler system put all through our health centre which cost us $70,000. 
and we had to have all new plans set up. And then the chapel that's right in the middle had to have double glass put on it in case there was a fire. Michael said to the councilman, where's the fire going to come from? That creek, that creek or that creek? <laughs> and he said to Michael, don't be flippant, Mr O'Neill. But anyway, you, you cannot, you have to comply or they will close you down. It was only by the grace of God. It sounds terrible to say this, but Michael's father passed and he was an aged gentleman and Michael got an inheritance that allowed us to pay the $250,000 that it cost us to remain open. But um, we have been able little by little to, you see, we, Michael and I own the property and Misty Mountain lease it off us for a small amount. And so that protects um, Misty Mountain. So just some of the, the things we have gone through with the devil hating this work and wanting to close us down. But two days after we got the order to close down, a councilman drove into the property and drove up in front of the office in the car park. And so Michael went out and said, what are you doing here? And the councilman said, I've come to check if you've got anyone in your rooms. And Michael said, get off my property immediately. And the man said, now, there's no need to be like that. I'm just going to have a look. So Michael said, get in your car, and he wouldn't. So Michael pushed him. And he said, this is physical abuse. Michael said, it is not. Now get off my property. And so immediately Michael rang the police and told the police what had happened. And they said, good on you, mate. We can't stand that bloke. You'll have no trouble from us. Do you know what a bloke is? Just a man. And then Michael immediately rang up the mayor and complained that we were being harassed. So no more did any council people come out. But what we did was we continued to run. And the guests gave a, a donation. Michael went to his accountant and found out legally what he could do. So we weren't supposed to have anyone there. But it takes five years to build your business up and then close down. So the guests came as friends and gave us donations and we hung all our washing under the veranda just in case council's looking at us from Google Earth. <laughs> and Michael parked all the cars in the big shed because there's a big, there's a big basketball. There's a big shed down here that's got a big basketball court in it. That was part of the boarding school. And so we drove all the cars in there. So we continued to run our health retreat through this time. It probably took about six months before we were able to, to comply with everything. And praise be to God that we, we finally got all the ticks. And so we are, we are running legally now. So that happened to us about, oh, I suppose about six years ago now. But what Michael did after this man, councilman came, he shut the front gate and he put a sign up, no admittance, have to get permission to enter the property. And if they did ask for permission, Michael had this two-page questionnaire that they had to fill out. They had to write down their name. They had to write down their home address. They had to write down if they'd had a police protection report done on them. Michael had this huge two pages. If anyone had to, one wanted to come onto our property. But um, no one did, so no one actually went ahead with that. So that's just one story of the, I think, four times we've been ordered to close down. Michael went to court to fight this and he, um, he, uh, he, he always represents himself because he really likes the spa in the courtroom. And, they, and the council had a bar barrister and they're, they're wanting the judge to close us down. And the barrister said, Mr O'Neill has built a building on a road, a designated road. And then Michael said, uh, excuse me, Your Honour, we've built nothing. In fact, state government built it. <laughs> and there's no road there. Do you know there was a road there 50 years ago? But do you know what we had to do? Buy the road. And you can't buy the road. So then we had to rent the road. Oh, if they want to take you down, they go into all these fine little laws. But many of the afflictions of the righteous. And the Lord does deliver us out of them all. But 
Well, we've, we've had some big battles in an attempt to keep our health retreat running. And I think the bigger you get, the more battles you have. So it's a real blessing, I think, to keep it small. When you keep it small, your overheads are small. And what really made ours go berserk, do you have that word, berserk? Really mushroom or blossom was when my lectures went overseas. Then we had a lot of people coming from overseas coming. But you saw how we started. We started very, very small. We started with very, very little. And you might not have eight children that you can have as staff. <laughs> but God sends the people. In fact, when I look at the people that we have, really God has sent them all. And most of, the, most of our staff started as volunteers. And the beauty of volunteers is if they're not much good at the end of the time, you can say, thank you very much, bye. <laughs> and if they're great, you say, look, can you stay? So that's the beauty of, of volunteers. Sometimes we get uh, teenagers having a break from school, school holidays, um, come and work. My granddaughters love coming and working at Misty Mountain in their school holidays, which is very nice. If they're really good workers, Michael will give them a, a little something, a bit of money. But if they're hopeless workers, he just says, ah, oh, thanks for your help. Bye. But you don't ask him to give them some money for being there? No, because we feed them. Uh, That's why you could ask for money. Yeah, but they work. And we had three ladies come from Europe and they wanted to volunteer but they wanted to play more than they volunteered. And then they started to complain about the food. And then they started to want special food. So Michael went and visited them and he said, I think it's best if you leave, it's not really working. With a great big smile on his face. And they were a little bit offended, but they left. But yeah, they, they weren't good value. Yeah? Do you have a workers meeting or something where you all meet and pray together? Yes, we do. In fact, while the lecture's on, you'll see 8.30 to 10.30. The first half hour from 8.30 to 9, the staff have a, a meeting together. We have a reading, we have a prayer, and then discussing anything, we keep it short, and then they, then they service the rooms. Yes? Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it already, but I wanted to know, the staff, do any of them also live on your private property or do they have their own houses? No, they all live on our property. Okay. Yeah, all of them. Yep, so, oh, there's another house there. That's Graham's house. And uh, that's, uh, they're both male staff houses. Although Shirley and Dave just got married, so the other male goes into there and Shirley and Dave live there now. And we've got a lot of single girls here. There's four main bedrooms. Uh, there's six bedrooms in there. That was the girls' dormitory. Sorry, boys' dormitory. When it was an Aboriginal boarding school. And what we have made into the health centre was the uh, girls' dormitory. But we've totally renovated that. And so you've got the hill goes down like that. The health, the health centre is a house like that. So that's... It's more like that. So that, the, our health centre's up there where we've got five rooms. And then down here's the laundry, laundry area. And then this is west. So even though it's down there, the western sun floods in, like you've got your western sun, sun now. So legally, you own all the houses, housing yeah. and property. Um, yeah. They're, are they, yeah, they're working for their rent. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 And what that also means is, you know, we account that in with their wages. So, uh, yeah. So things like fermentation, stuff like that, or a cheap pack, you just do if it's really necessary. That's right. That's right. If someone has a, 
a problem. Usually when we do the initial consultations, we have a chart where we write down this person's got a sore ear, so try a lying in poultice on them after their steam sauna before they go to bed. This person's got a um, infected toenail, so we'll do hot and colds on them and maybe a poultice overnight. This person's got plantar fasciitis, so they can have hot and colds morning and night. So usually in the initial consultation, the, the uh, health director will, will write that down. And how does the teas? Because you do everyday teas for the people. We usually we usually do teas uh, through the lecture. Our um, it's so uh, we've got two hours there, and after one hour, there's a five minute break. But after half an hour, so at nine o'clock, herb teas are served because they're just starting to fall asleep sometimes, and then they have a half hour break, and then at ten o'clock, the juice is served. So at every half hour something happens. So the three teas are ginger, lemongrass, peppermint. So before the lecture start, one staff member goes around person to person. We're gonna serve a tea in half an hour, what would you like? And then we make up uh, the big coffee pots, the glass percolators. Um, How much do you drink? Like usually a cup. A cup. Mm -hmm. So we do one of ginger, one of peppermint. And we do that, we, we call 8 to 8.30 peak hour in, in the lodge because it's um, collecting the, the juice that's been served at 8, but it's collecting the glasses, rinsing them, putting them in the dishwasher, making the teas. Someone else goes around and, and, and gets the um, who wants what tea because at 8.30 when the lecture starts, it's quiet. It's quiet in the health centre. And... The, the staff will go and have their, um, their worship time. And then at nine o'clock, one staff member comes up and just pours the tea because they've been ma already made. And uh, the other couple of staff members go and start uh, servicing the rooms. Mm -hmm. And you've written their probiotics? Yeah. Yes, we give them at uh, six o'clock in the morning, they have the lemon aloe water and we also give them a little bit of probiotic and a bit of water. What kind of probiotic? We, we have a vegetarian probiotic powder that we I buy. Bought, buy a probiotic mm. powder? Mm. No, nothing special, just no. any probiotic yeah. powder? And you put that with the juice? No, we have it by itself in a little bit of water yes. and they throw that down and then they drink their aloe water. And that's at uh, 6.15, so they're woken at 6. At 6.15, they're given their aloe water, and then at 6.30, the exercise program begins. Mm -hmm. Why probiotics every mm -hmm. day? Why probiotics every day? Because most people, we find, uh, their gut flora is not what it should be for you know, a whole lot of reasons. Technical question. If there was a failure of power, are you sending yourself with energy? Was We've got right? large solar panels, huge amount of solar panels. Um, I don't know if Australia is still doing it, but the government was subsidising if you put solar on your house. So Michael took advantage of that. And uh, we've got huge amount of solar panels, more than you'd fit on this roof here. And um, we do have a generator because we live out in the bush and sometimes the power goes. And when you've got a storm, often the power goes. We used to, oh, we've lost power. And in our homes, it's not a big deal, but in the health centre, you, you have to keep it comfortable and nice for the guests. So we have, have a couple of generators, generators as backups. <coughs> yeah. Do you have some versus time for the guests? No, we don't. Yeah. We find that um, the guests struggle, some of the guests struggle with even us praying with the meal. So we go, we go very lightly. We leave it up to the therapists whether they uh, pray with their, with their massage. And if they do, they always say to the guest, um, do you mind if I pray? 
when I used to do colonics, I always ask the guests. And even the atheists, they go, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> So the probiotic powder, you abide in the bulk? Yeah, uh, we buy it in little containers because it has to be airtight, it can deteriorate. Mm. But, but we give them a quarter of a teaspoon, so it lasts quite a while. So you uh, recommend them that they take it at home as well? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It depends if they've been on, anti they've been on three courses of antibiotics, uh, you know, we would. Well, everybody has stress. Yeah. From a 7 p.m. Uh, demo talk DVD, what? Yeah. Uh, we have a variety of DVDs we show at night. Uh, Game Changers, that's a, a really good one. About the athletes that have gone vegan and having great results. Uh, another one is Forks Over Knives, I think that's Dr. Colin Campbell's. Mm -hmm. One, uh, Health Matters, that's, that's another one. We have one called Rooted, and that's about root canal fillings, the dangers of root canal fillings. Mm -hmm. And Quicksilver, I think we've got one called Quicksilver, and that's also on mercury and a little bit the root canal. So we have a variety, mm -hmm. so that if we have someone there for two weeks, um, we might show slightly different from week mm -hmm. to week. And usually one night, Marlena does a poultice demonstration. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. They don't have any cooking dem demonstrations. We do, we do. Uh, where we have the cooking demonstration, I don't know if it's there. Um, we've, and we, we found that the guests really wanted them. So, oh, and it's not officially on here. So it's usually Thursday at 2.15. So straight after lunch. So while they're down in the kitchen, we say there's a cooking demonstration and what the, uh, what the cook will usually do, see we have waffles on Friday morning, they'll demonstrate how to make the waffles, they might demonstrate how to do the pear cream and they might demonstrate we do a, um, like a granola with um, soaked dehydrated buckwheat so they show, might show how to do that. So I've always maintained that it shouldn't be an extra work for the cook. It's something they're going to be doing anyway. So uh, when I was working there, we used to do it Wednesday and Thursday afternoon because Friday's very busy because the cooks are making extra food for Sabbath. Mm. So Friday doesn't really work with a cooking demo. So do you give some uh, notes that with them? Yeah, we have a cookbook that we give our guests that's got all the Misty Mountain recipes in it. But not the notes what you were now at when you talk or something like that? No. Mm. Yes? Um, in regard to posture, uh, with these exercises, what are you using there? Posture and core exercises. Posture. Posture. Yeah. Oh, yes. We used to call it Pilates, but someone got upset and they think, some people seem to think that Pilates is new age. So to keep everyone happy, we now call it posture and core exercise. So they're exercises on mats on the floor designed to strengthen the, the core muscles. And that goes for half an hour. And that works very well on the uh, Monday, Tuesday, because Monday, Tuesday, when Howard's got them doing that, the staff can have lunch. And then after, you know, at 1.30, then the staff have finished lunch and Howard can go and have his lunch. And then on the eating days, they just uh, do it half an hour before lunch. The recipe book you're talking about, do you have it uh, somewhere you can buy that? Ah. Uh, um, I guess they have it somewhere on the computer. Um, What's the name of it? Uh, Misty Mountain Cookbook. But I, I don't, we usually just give it to the guests, but it's possible. I suppose I could ask Michael if there's a way it could be sent to Benjamin. Yeah? 
<coughs> just a question about the schedule. It's it's interesting. It goes from 4 p.m. and then back to 3 p. 3:30 p.m. and then onwards to 4:15. Yeah. But I guess that's only a way of saying that uh, you you do things in parallel. But yeah. you, but if you have a look, the people um, the people that are going down to the 3:30 steam bath. Yeah. They will have their four o'clock juice when they back get get back from their steam that's, bath. That's what I was just saying. Yeah, thinking. but the peop but the guys who have the four thirty steam bath, they will have their juice then go to their steam bath. Yeah. yeah. So they have quite a bit of free time in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in on the first evening when we do the induction lecture, um, we go over. We, we put the times down and show them what happens every day. So we have given them this, but we also show and then explain what GB is. It's green barley and it's the best blood and tissue cleanser. The protein powder on Tuesday when you hear the lecture on the liver, you'll find out why the protein powder is very important. Um, so we go through what everything means and then we say, if you don't have a treatment in those treatment times, that's your free time. So we say, what can you do in your free time? So then we have a list of a whole lot of things. They can go for a swim in the creek. They can go for a walk. Uh, they might access our library, which is quite extensive. Uh, we have tennis courts. So tennis courts are here next to the shed. And... They might play tennis. We've got a few rackets and a ball, and there's a basketball thing. We've also got some bikes, so if they want to go mm -hmm. bike riding. So we list a whole lot of things that they can do. We've got jigsaws. We've got uh, colouring in books, because you know that's quite popular in Australia, uh, really intricate colouring in books. So we just give them a whole lot of things, because some people are worried. They say, what am I going to do? So we give them a whole lot of things and we have a chapel and in the chapel is a piano and if and it's uh, so let's so that's the health that's the health end of the chapel chapel is there so it's right next to it so they can go and play the piano or we say or if you'd like just a little place to to be quiet and think you can go and sit in the chapel yeah, you have lectures. There are one, two, three, four in a week, is it right? Two hours every day. And you get, get two to the eight laws of health yeah. every day, two. Yeah. And then you have at the end of the week, Thursday and Friday, also consultations, and then you are looking on the results, what has happened. Yeah, yeah. So what, what happens with the consultations is... Uh, you sit with the person, I always note what was their reason for coming and then address that in, in what you write up. And uh, I know Graham has a, has a template on his computer of a program and what he'll do is he'll just adjust it a little bit, print that out and give that to them. Are you taking some, uh, for example, blood pressure? And, uh... Oh, not usually. Because again, the blood pressure doesn't change in the week. Yeah. Blood sugars, we leave that with the person who's a diabetic. If they want us to take their blood pressure, we will. But there's usually not much of a change in a week. But we have a blood pressure machine there if they want it. And are you always taking this blood analysis or is it in special cases? Uh, no, Graham does it with everybody that comes in. Yes? Uh, I guess people come for a week. Uh, and stay for a week, but uh, what about uh, long-term uh, uh, diseases like cancer? Uh, um, will you recommend them to come back uh, or, or are you waiting for them to say, okay, I want to come back in, in four weeks yeah. or come regularly? Yeah, and, and it depends on many, many things, many things. See, what we do is we teach them what to do while they're here with us and then they go home and implement it. And uh, we always say if someone's serious, it's better that they stay the two weeks. Mm. 
and we usually do two weeks together, so there is the option of staying two weeks. Mm. But do you also have possibilities of people coming just for a short stay, like a one day if they want no. to do a health colonic or, or something specific? No, we don't. Mm. No, not usually. No. Mm. Now, if we're low, if we only have three guests, um, that's, that's very difficult because the whole machinery has to start up for, for that many. And we have someone saying, can I just come for two days? Michael would probably say yes. But what we aim for is that we have people in the rooms for the whole seven days. So even though I said no, there are exceptions to the rule that um, I know my niece, she was... She had a few seizures and she wanted to come and have a few treatments so they came and stayed and just stayed the night and did treatments one day and the next. It's a bit like this course here uh, where, where we did the same thing and experienced yeah. the same thing so we know the problem. Are you, a farm, are you having a form of check up every morning and see how the person is developing that you are talking about? Uh, well we, we are in touch with them the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> On the website, um, I saw there that your name is not mentioned, and you are no. not on the stuff. No, and you are no. not in health director there. No. So there, there, there are no health directors on the website. Or Graham. Oh, okay. Yeah, Graham's Graham's our health director now. But you are. No, I I am not allowed to be there. I so you know, I have the ban on me. Okay. And apparently. A guy looked up the website and it linked to me and then it had, you know, that I'm a threat to public safety and da 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 da. And everything he read about it, he thought, that's the place I want to go. <laughs> 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 and when I was in um, uh, England last week, you know, the Time newspaper did an article like that, that I'm a threat to public safety, that I'm a, a quack, all of that. All it seemed to do was, was let the people that have been following my YouTubes know that I was there. And we had this huge roll up on Saturday afternoon of people. So, um, but there are people that will go, well, I, I don't want anything to do with someone like that. So it, it has been best that my name be totally extracted from there. Ideally, Michael's name should be extracted too because they're, they're really after him because of his political party. If we could get somebody to run Misty Mountain Health Retreat, as Michael does, we would happily step out. Well, Michael would happily step out. Mm. Okay, I think we've done a good day, yeah? And we'll continue a little bit more tomorrow. So let us, um, let us close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and your mercy and thank you for this right arm of the gospel message. Thank you for this training school that is enabling us to learn how we can each implement the principles into our own lives in our own ways. I pray now you bless us all with a relaxing evening and a good night's sleep ready for our last day tomorrow. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.